Welcome to another episode of The Fundable Founder. I'm here today with Kevin Frechette, founder and CEO of Fair Market, which you can see right on my wall here. We display their logo proudly in the office. Uh, welcome, Kevin. Thanks for having me. And I'm sure you switch up with logos right behind your head every time to make everyone <laughs> yeah, special. I so don't. I, I, I appreciate that, Charlie. Fair Market gets prime display right next to my left ear or right ear uh, on every one of my Zoom calls. Happy to hear. Excited. <laughs> so um, tell us a little bit about Fair Market. What's your elevator pitch? Yeah. So the enterprise procurement space as a whole is wildly archaic, uh, but at the same time, over $8 trillion flows through the B2B space. Um, so when we really took a look at that market, we said it's ripe for disruption and innovation. So what we did is we built out a machine learning based SaaS platform that helps big companies automate the way that they buy goods and services. Um, and the net benefit for them is we help them save a lot of money, get competitive bidding, we help save a ton of time to reallocate headcount. And we give them all the data and the control to make sure that they're de-risking what they buy. So it's uh, uh, the enterprise procurement space, one of those sexy markets that everyone always talks about. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of VCs have that in their theses is uh, disrupting the procurement space. But um, no, that's a tremendous elevator pitch, but it is it has become such a hot space. You guys were just in the in the early days of it, right? So, you know, tell me a little bit about your origin story. Uh, it goes back about three, four years now, I think, and, and why you decided to start this and how you went about uh, building the business. Yeah, um, so I am from Central Mass, went to UMass Amherst, started in finance right after college, moved to sales after uh, for a big tech company then a mid-sized tech company. And the, the problem that we saw, and I met one of my co-founders at one of those tech companies, was that no two companies had any idea what the other one paid for the same software, hardware, or service in the IT space. And it blew our minds that one company would spend $600,000, the company right next to them, literally next door, same industry, would spend $400,000 to buy the exact same thing. Yep. And we thought that's an area that is ripe for disruption that needs some data. So we started back in 2017, uh, took the leap of faith, started in the Boston Public Library, and we've done, done like six offices around Boston. Our favorite was over a bar, the corner pub, uh, nice. where, where the power went out literally every single day. <laughs> but essentially, we, uh, we started on the mission of building like a true car or a Kelly Blue Book for IT software pricing to show companies what other people paid for the same thing. And we, uh, we did that for about three or four months. And the way that we started was we just cold called hundreds of companies. And we knew we wanted to go after the enterprise space because that was our background. Uh, but we set up all these executive meetings and we started to pitch our idea in like a Shark Tank S vibe. No, in no way discovery just came and just like threw it in their face. And uh, the overall feedback <laughs> was that people at Gartner, IDC, Forrester, and really big teams to help out with their large purchases, not just IT, but anything. Uh, but we started to hear this other side of the spectrum, which is all these small to medium-sized purchases, say anything under 500K that wasn't being touched because there's no tools that could automate that or make it efficient to touch it. So we, we took a step back and said, that's an interesting space. And then we looked at procurement as a whole and we said, you know what? procurement industry is just a legacy. It's the same old process for the last 30 years. And the two big players are SAP and Oracle. Right. So we thought we would like to disrupt that. We know it's a huge market. And if we came in with this small to medium sized spend, it's called tail spend. <laughs> if you get into these big companies, I guess I'm getting feedback from the dog. It's probably a thumbs up. Dog um, loves it. I, so we could get in and wedge in and then over time expand out and up. So that's, uh, that's how we got in tail spend. That's how we got in the world of procurement. So, you know, as you think about launching your first business, you know, how much time did you spend building product? How much time did you spend building team? How much time did you spend talking to customers all while thinking about when is the right time to fundraise? How did you put those, those puzzle pieces together? So we knew we needed someone from a tech perspective. So that's where we found our third co-founder, co Victor. Um, we found him about a month in just because we had no technical background at all. Uh, so that was really important to get one technical founder. Outside of that, we were less concerned about scaling the team early on because we knew we really had to bake out our idea and just get in front of more companies. Um, so the, the thing we prioritized most heavily right off the bat was just external conversations, just getting from getting as many conversations with as many different types of people as possible. And we would show them um, like, like just screenshots. We'd show them like PowerPoints. This is what we're thinking. Like, let's talk about it. What resonates, what doesn't. So we did that for a couple months um, until we started to really refine it. Um, from a fundraising perspective, I, we, we took the approach that everyone says not to do, 
which is just like start fundraising immediately. Just start talking, talking to people. Talking yeah. to every VC in the world. So we uh, we went after like the top, like the biggest, like probably series C, series D VCs right off the bat. <laughs> immediately got a no or no, or come, come back when you have a million in ARR. In but they actually responded to you. We, we leveraged um, the like the network that we had in Boston. Okay. So we, we started working with Latham and Watkins from a law firm. We had a couple different connections. Um, but I mean, we, we approached it in a way of just like, kind of like a sales approach, just like get out was a numbers game, which looking back was not the right call, but it's just the only thing that we knew how to do right then. That's awesome. Um, and so let's talk about the fundraise a little bit. So you guys went out, you know, kind of just figured out what you, you, you were going to make, have as many conversations as possible. What, what did you learn along the way and what was some of the best advice you got? Yeah. Um, so the, every fundraise has been different um, from like the seed round took like over a year to the A took a month to the series B took two weeks. So we've kind of like refined as we've gone um, for the seed, the, the approach that we took, which looking back was not the right one, was we went for the, like the larger species when we had like no customers essentially or one customer. And then that was it. Like and we asked for $2 million, like everyone does with no justification behind it. And then we went from that to saying, oh, maybe we went way too far up. We went all the way back down. So we went to um, a lot of the angel groups, which can be great, a huge value add. They, you refine your pitch. Uh, we did pick up a couple of angels along that track, but that was still like a long process for us to go through to all these different groups, all the additional meetings. Um, and as we are doing that, the biggest advice that we got was two things. Strike while the iron's hot, whether from a fundraising perspective in terms of interest from VCs and from a sales perspective of having momentum with deals. So uh, we focused big on the deal one because we didn't have the term sheet from the, the VC side. So what we did is we just doubled down on sales as we are doing the fundraise. And we are keeping updates all the time. You were getting them around like, oh, we closed this customer, this customer, this customer. Oh, we have pipeline with these deals. This is what we've learned along the way. And that's what helped us over time build the credibility with the people we were talking to. Um, but then we actually, the, the biggest like, uh, turning point, inflection point I raised was we thought uh, back in like April of 2018, so maybe about a year in, we, we thought we were getting a term sheet. Um, and the term sheet, like, so we, we got other people committed around it. Uh, we had a few different groups, but we had one lead. Uh, it literally evaporated on one phone call at like nine o'clock at night on Thursday. Uh, so it was one of those, like, I, I did like, if there was ever a moment I'm like, oh man, <laughs> uh, it was, if we keep a positive attitude towards fundraising and the whole company. So it was never like stressful or negative. It was one of those like, oh, like right through the fingers. And I did get good feedback from the, the person that it did kind of like evaporate with. Cause I asked the person, I said, if you were in my shoes, what would you do right now? And they said, just get out there and grind, like go, nice. go fight for one. So uh, ended up, we ended up just writing a term sheet ourselves. And then the, the big inf the lesson learned we had is we actually went after that to seed level VCs. Yep. So VCs that cut checks that were 100,000 to a million, as opposed to going for the 25 or going for the 2 million. And then we ended up actually getting based off of writing our own term sheet and going out to, to like the correct level VCs. We ended up getting, I think, six or seven VCs that wanted to come in. We brought it down to, uh, I think, three at the time. So we were able to oversubscribe in the round. It was a, a great outcome. That's fantastic. And, um, you know, one, one of the things you mentioned in there was that you just kind of kept people updated on your sales wins and your progress and other things. And, and you did that religiously. Um, and I think that just demonstrates, you know, seed stage investors are looking to invest in people, right? And they're looking for certain characteristics in those people. And, you know, one of it, one of the characteristics is just that, you know, that ability to learn and grow, right? And so uh, with those kind of monthly updates, you can, you can see that learning and growth in real time so that when it does come time to write the check, you feel like that trust has been built, the relationship has been built, and you really feel, have a good sense of who the founder is. In that, I'd say that applies to not just the seed as well, where the, for our A, Insight did our A. Um, and I talked to Insight in 2000, early 2018, a year and a half before they did it. And I said, here's where we're at. Here's where we're going to go. Every quarter, they'd call me. And yeah. um, we wouldn't keep everyone up to date to this, like religiously, but for top tier ones we wanted to work with. And I'd tell them every quarter. So we did. So we did. Instead, by the time we came for our A, they're like, you've done what you said you're going to do. We're going to believe what you do in the future. 
So then for our B round, exact same thing happened. We met with GGV for our A. We said this we're at, we, we couldn't make it work from a timing perspective. We said, this is where we're going. We went back to them in a year and said, we did it. Here's where we're going again. <laughs> and they're like, yep, that works. Like you, you've proven that you can do what you said you're going to do. Yeah, no, that's um, the most successful entrepreneurs we've worked with. That is exactly the uh, methodology they follow. Um, so, you know, companies in our portfolio that have had big exits like Applause, that was the exact game plan they they used, the, the playbook they used uh, for fundraising going forward. Um, going back to your, your, seed, your seed round, I mean, you guys were three somewhat unproven entrepreneurs, uh, very energetic and had a, a, a great, something you were very passionate about. What were some of the things that looking back, you didn't do so well in the fundraising round or things that just maybe even were embarrassing now that you look back on it? Yeah. So uh, a couple, a couple things. So one was the one that's not embarrassing, but that we wouldn't do again is um, overshare, um, going down the path too far with a team that, you know, from a venture perspective is not interested uh, and just like going through hoops, doing homework assignments, just sharing more and more data for the sake of sharing data. Uh, typically I found that if, if someone's interested, they really believe in the mission, they believe in the company, it, they actually request less data because they get the big picture. They know it's a seed investment and they know it like, yeah, the conversions matter from your pipeline to your upside, but it doesn't really matter as much. Right. It's, is the team going to have the ability to grit it out and execute? And is this space one that we're interested in? So I'd say if someone's asking for a ton of information, just to further qualify, like, okay, like what are you looking to get out of this information? And then put timeframes around it. The, uh, I would call it embarrassing, but the area that we definitely learned not to do is, um, especially early on, we kind of overcompensated uh, for like our lack of traction with like what got described multiple times as a very salesy uh, okay. pitch. And in like, and I fully see it. I, I would get up there and I just go and be talking at a million miles per hour, talking about Victor our CTO as our golden goose, like having fun with it. Like it's great to have fun, but we were, we were kind of overselling um, like where we were at as a state company. Mm. I think that probably also shows a lack of self-awareness uh, for the, the challenge that we have ahead. Uh, where even for our B round, some of the feedback that we got on when we did the partner meeting um, is they really appreciated that uh, we made comments like, you know, we're, like this is areas that we're very strong on. Here's the areas that we're still figuring out. Yep. Like, we're not positive on this, but yep. we're gonna keep working on that and digging in. And they said that a lot of times founders come in, they're like, oh, we're the best, 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 best. And that shows that maybe they're naive or they don't have the self-awareness to know like what are their actual weaknesses? Yep. Because then those are things that should really get worked on. Yeah, no, that's, that's great advice. And um, you know, you hit the nail on the head, right? At the seed stage, you're investing in a team you're investing in their vision and their ability to, to reach that vision. And all along the way, it's important that, you know, the entrepreneurs are certainly driven, passionate, know the path they want to go down, but be self-aware, right? Like know what you're not good at and seek advice from people on how to get better at those things. I mean, what are, what are, you know, some of the people you've leaned on for advice and mentorship along the way and in helping you develop, you know, your team and your, your company better. Yeah. And thinking back in the last question, just like what is embarrassing or what did you do wrong? <clears throat> also, I remember that salesiness and we actually put someone to sleep in one of my presentations in one of the intergroup group meetings, which looking back is like a nuts thought that like I was talking to someone literally just fell asleep. Um, <laughs> but uh, people I, I relied on uh, or I leaned on for help. Uh, my number one mentor has been Lou Shipley. Yeah. Uh, so Lou's a multi-time CEO in Boston. Um, just had a great exit with Synopsys over at Black Duck. <laughs> He's someone that um, believed in the mission right away, believed in our team. And he's seen like the game film so many times that I, 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 he's very much a soundboard for me when strategizing, going into the meetings. Um, I've leveraged like yourself. I've leveraged our other VCs, anyone that you pick up in different rounds, they have a very good perspective because they see it a lot more than I do. So I think part of that is just picking what is the area that I'm going to go to mass ventures for? Where am I going to 1984 for? What am I going to new fund for? Because it's good to get everyone's feedback, but it's really good to know I'm going to you for this, this, or this. Yep. Um, the final one is other founders. Like, yeah. can't, can't be overstated. Like they, they literally, people that have just gone through it. So if you're raising your seed, talk to people that the A. If you're doing the A, the B, because they've gone through the same thing, meetings with the exact same people. 
and it's fresh. So it's like relevant to like the last 12 to 18 months. So we've, uh, Tarek, one of my co-founders, he's done a great job of setting up like a Boston community of uh, founders and just making sure like we're just collaborating across the board. That's great. Um, so, you know, we're, we're just about out of time here. Any final thoughts, pieces of advice you would like to share uh, with aspiring entrepreneurs out there? Um, I'd say a couple of things. So one is it, sometimes it can be viewed as hard, but just try to stay positive and have fun with it mm-hmm. because otherwise like you're going to get told no 98% of the time. And that's going to happen. Like, it, like no matter what company you are. Uh, so if you approach it with a make or break, we need this. Um, a, it's going to come off not as strong it, right. from, from a venture perspective, but also it's going to be demotivating for you for keeping the momentum at your company. And if you have a employee base that's growing, they can feel if you're stressed about it or if you don't feel good about it. So just like staying positive is just going to help the momentum all together. Yep. Um, the other side is I, I, I think the, the biggest kind of reflection I have on the fundraising process is it's kind of like a complex enterprise sale. So I, I would view it like that if you are a, a founder of fundraising. So in a sale, when, you, when you're going after a, like a patch or a territory, you're mapping out all the different accounts. You're doing diligence on them. You're networking and back channeling into them. When you're actually having the meetings, <clears throat> you're working to define who are the decision makers, who are the influencers, who can I pull into back channel to those people? And then you're doing this across multiple, it could be 20 or 30 different VCs. And then you need to create the urgency. Yep. Where, where like the strike while the iron's hot, once again, it's so critical. So the same thing as a deal. You have to like find where is it a fit? What's the pain? Does it fit their model and their thesis? And then why now? The inflection point. So it's building that inflection point for why at your company you're ready to scale. Yeah, I think that's the one piece a lot of uh, aspiring entrepreneurs miss is the why now. It it just, the way you tell your story needs two things. You need to show that there's other interests because there is that FOMO aspect that's real. Uh, But then the other one is, the story of why at this inflection point, is it the right time to invest? Because you're about to go from this to this. And that could be a deal. That could be tech. That could be a hire. That could be anything. But you need that. Because otherwise, why not wait for six months and sit on it? Yep. You need to create that urgency. That's awesome. So we'll, we'll, we'll end there because that is fantastic advice. I asked one final question, and that's how do you describe yourself in one word? Um, positive. Positive. I love it. Well, thank you, Kevin. Uh, you know, congratulations on all your success to date. I can't wait to see what the future holds for Fair Market. Cool. Thanks, Charlie. All right. Thank you. Talk to you later. To innovate, invent, and disrupt, we're your partner to fuel your growth. Contact us to learn more.